Joe Weiss is a name most joining the call today will uh, recognize as a recognized authority on cybersecurity and control systems. He has over 40 years of experience in industrial instrumentation controls and automation environments. He is the managing director of ISA 99, a registered professional engineer in California. And uh, his lists of honors and awards on his LinkedIn is extensive and uh, would take probably the talk here to walk through each one of them and uh, the amazing work that, uh, that was done to, to earn them. Um, today, he's going to be joining us and presenting on the topic of solar winds, which has been brought up a number of times in this uh, conference in regards to specifically how people in the OT and industrial control system and uh, process uh, automation side should think about um, the solar winds events and what it means to them. So Joe, thank you for joining us and I will turn the virtual stage over to you. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> this is uh, number one, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. You sure can, sir. Okay. So first of all, I wanted to thank SANS for inviting me. Um, this is actually my first time speaking at SANS. So this has been very interesting for me. And it's also been really fascinating to listen or look at the presentations up till now. Um, without being flippant, it's really great to see after 20 years of banging and banging and banging to see how far we've actually come. So I'm really, really um, uh, happy and impressed seeing what's going on. Um, the one thing I did want to point out before we go further is in a sense, what's, what's still missing? And I'll be going through that as I go through the presentation. But what's still missing is the focus on the actual control system devices themselves, not just the networks. I think, again, there's been just phenomenal uh, efforts all around uh, addressing the network issues. Um, as a control system engineer, actually an instrumentation and controls engineer, um, my focus has really been on devices and you'll hear that also as I go through this and kind of the solar winds issues. Next, where is, oops, um, oh, here it is. Sorry about that. Okay, like I say, I've been around quite a while. Um, what I wanted to point out is control systems. Again, I think everybody knows this, so I'm going to zoom through real quick, but it's ubiquitous. You find these everywhere. And one of the things that's interesting to me is if you look at the bottom left, what you're looking at is a ventilator, like for COVID. That's a control system. Not only are there issues with the ventilator, there's issues, cyber issues, with the manufacturing process for making the ventilator. They're just This is not just power plants or refineries. This is across the board. And again, part of the issue I'm going to have with solar winds is exactly that. I know there's been a lot of discussions about um, the Purdue reference model. Um, it is outdated when you start talking about the cyber issues. What I wanted to point out, my focus is really level zero, level one. Um, that's the level zero one devices to this day still have no cyber security, no authentication and no cyber logging. And a lot of these new, even zero one devices now have connectivity directly to the cloud or directly to the internet, which is kind of scary when you realize there's no uh, security there. The other thing I wanted to point out um, is <clears throat> my definition, because I want to go through just a couple of little things dealing with what's happened to date, is what is a cyber incident? I think the de facto IT definition, you're connected to the internet, you're running windows and data is maliciously being manipulated or stolen. It's all about privacy. The definition I use 
is one of the NIST definitions that a cyber incident is electronic communication between systems that affects confidentiality, integrity, or availability. And the key point here is there's no mention of the word malicious. So number one, it doesn't have to be malicious. Number two, there have been a number of incidents where the only difference between malicious versus unintentional has been motivation. And number three, what a sophisticated hacker will do will make a cyber attack look like an equip, uh, equipment malfunction. So it's very important. The other point I wanted to get across before I start is this term operational technology. There is a lot of um, misunderstanding, at least in the engineering world, as what OT is. Uh, in many, many instances, what OT is, is the control system networks. Often, you know, these the official, you can never say never, but the turbine engineer, the relay engineer, the instrument engineer, the manufacturing engineer, the safety engineer, do not consider themselves to be OT. Often have never even heard the term. So one of the things that's really important when we have these discussions is really trying to define what is meant by OT. Is it truly everything that isn't IT or is it really just the networks? Now, this is my one techie slide. Again, all of this is gonna lead into what does solar winds do and mean? As you look at this slide, as you go from right to left, you're going from, if you will, the pure IT to the pure engineering. And one of the things I wanted to point out prior to Stuxnet, cyber ended in the control room at the HMI. Because of Stuxnet, we now look pretty closely at the PLCs or in the uh, um, electrical world, it would be considered an intelligent electronic device, smart relay, smart breaker, et cetera. Um, those are now looked at for security. But you look at a PLC, you know, there's a big issue about secure coding. What is secure coding when you have <clears throat> ladder logic? But what I really wanna get across is when you get to things like control valves, motors, sensors, actuators, uh, chemical analyzers, these are engineering devices that have no cybersecurity, have no authentication, have no cyber logging. Um, additionally, um, our legacy devices don't have any cybersecurity requirements, because the cybersecurity requirements, like with ISA 62443-4-2, which is the component spec document, it just doesn't apply to legacy, and legacy includes what's being built today, devices. I just wanted to point this out, that control system cyber incidents are real. One of the things that I think does hurt the discussions in the boardroom is being able to point to real cases that have already occurred that have caused actual impacts. My database is well over 1,300 incidents to date. Um, they range from electric, water, oil, gas, chemicals, manufacturing, uh, medical devices, um, transportation, you name it. Um, <clears throat> there's been over 1,500, <clears throat> excuse me, deaths to date, well, well over $70 billion in direct damage. Most of these incidents haven't even been identified as being cyber related. And that's part of the issue when you get below the level zero, or excuse me, below, if you will, pre-reference model level three. 
is there is a need to train the engineers, not just the network people. Real quickly, what you're looking at, top left was complete destruction of a turbine. As best as we can tell, and you'll find this a lot when you start talking about real incidents, as best as we can tell, because we don't have all of the appropriate uh, quote unquote cyber forensics <clears throat> you would have when you're dealing with networks. What you're looking at there is complete destruction of a turbine. As best as we can tell, that was actually an Aurora attack. What you're looking at in the middle top is the Aurora event <clears throat> or the Aurora test at Idaho in March, 2007. Upper right was the DC Metro train crash. That was the red line train crash that killed 11. Uh, yes, it was control system cyber. No, it was not malicious. Go down to the middle, that's a San Bruno natural gas pipeline rupture. Again, yes, it was, in uh, yes, it was control system cyber. The Pacific Gas and Electric is now a convicted felon because of that incident. What you're looking at the middle is the uh, uh, Bellingham, Washington Olympic pipeline rupture that killed three. What's interesting about this, three people went to jail and this led directly to the bankruptcy of the Olympic Pipeline Company, which was a joint venture of Shell and Texaco. What you see on the, on the middle right was the Marucci wastewater hack back in 2000. What, what, what I found interesting was uh, following the Oldsmar uh, event, there was an awful lot of uh, discourse back and forth about the fact that no Oldsmar was not the first water system. When I brought this up, somebody brought up that in 2017, there was a similar situation that occurred in the Netherlands. Um, <clears throat> lower left was the tilting of an offshore oil platform by hacking into the buoyancy system, which are looking at the uh, bottom middle and I always have a problem with this name. It's the Soviet Sol, uh, Solchenich. I'm not sure exactly the best way to phrase it. That's a 6,400 megawatt hydro facility in Russia. And it turned out to be, again, it was control system cyber. They lifted a thousand ton turbine off its pedestal. This was complete destruction of a 6,400 megawatt hydro facility that killed 75. And what's scary is when this happened, Russia thought we did it. On the bottom right is a brand new Navy ship that didn't even make it from where it was built in Milwaukee to uh, the Norfolk Navy base. It had to be tied, or excuse me, towed in because control system cyber uh, damaged the propulsion system. Uh, the key here is there is very, very, very little information sharing on incidents. Great information sharing on uh, vulnerabilities. But the other point is there's not much use of these real incidents when you talk about designer training and that really needs to change. Now, where are we now? This is starting to get into the whole issue dealing with um, <clears throat> solar winds. Um, the reason that I'm going to be talking a lot from here on out about building control systems is building control systems are very much directly affected by solar winds, whereas the rest of OT can be affected because what solar winds does is solar winds is essentially a SCADA system for network management. And so what it does is it implements SNMP, simple network management protocol. Well, <clears throat> the issue there is SNMP actually controls, monitors and controls all building control. It also monitors all OT network switches. 
So when people talk about the need for segmenting IT and OT, this is kind of the classic case of why you've got to do it. You know, what the Russians did with solar winds is they really got a twofer. Obviously, what everybody talks about is the access into the IT network and what they've been able to do. What I'm going to be talking about is what else they have access to, which are the control systems via, if you will, SNMP or Modbus serial, you name it, which is what solar winds allows to occur. Um, part of which you're also looking at, I gave a similar presentation and I'm supposed to give another to the uh, Federal Facilities Council. Uh, this is the, uh, the operators of all of our federal buildings um, because this is very, very, very much focused on in a sense because of the access to SNMP and Modbus serial, you know, what happens to building controls. The other thing that was interesting was, I think it was last week or the week before, it was announced that France has their own version of the SolarWinds hack, Centrion. Now, it's not as big, it's an older system and you can put whatever caveats you want on it. But from my perspective of what does it allow in, it's very, very similar to what we're talking about solar winds with respect to control systems. And one of the reasons, again, why this is so important, one of the things SNMP does is gives you access and control to uninterruptible power supplies. What did the Russians do in the first Ukrainian uh, you know, cyber attack back in 2015? They compromised the UPS. So the issue is, does Russia know what they're doing with respect to solar winds and control systems? Yes, and they've already done it. Now the solar winds hack, this is something that all of you know, but I'll just throw it out anyways because it, it's where it puts us. As I mentioned, solar winds, it's the underlying network infrastructure. You know, anybody who works in network management has heard of solar winds. Anybody who hasn't worked in network management probably hadn't heard of solar winds until December. When I first heard about solar winds, I thought it was a desert storm. Um, it's another point about this, and it's something I've said geez, pretty much from the beginning. If a sophisticated nation state wants to get you, they're probably going to be able to do it. This was a very sophisticated attack. Again, not detectable, unclear how deep the intrusion goes. But part of the issue, again, I'm concerned is there's been little done focusing on the potential impact to control systems. Again, what did the Russians defeat? Two-factor authentication, digital certificates, and signed software firmware upgrades. So you can talk about, well, it all started because of, you know, possibly, you know, solar ones, one, two, three. But look at what happened in all of the really sophisticated organizations they were able to compromise. And then you think about the control system world, which is so far behind. What's the impact? Okay, solar winds. Again, because it's at the SNMP, you're talking about data centers, control centers, laboratories, manufacturing buildings. The other thing it does is it can cause common cause failures, common mode failures. I happen to be a nuclear engineer. One of the things that has always, always, you know, concerned me is the concept of a common mode failure that you can affect you know, a failure mode can affect multiple, multiple devices because that can directly um, defeat resiliency, uh, redundancy, diversity, 
Common mode failures are probably the worst thing you can look at. Um, one of the other things about solar winds is it not only affects end users, <clears throat> but it also affects our OEMs and system integrators. Um, you know, again, I never realized just how ubiquitous solar winds is. Um, and all of the guidance that's been put out that I've seen, whether it's coming from solar winds, you know, CISA, you name it, has all focused on the network aspects and not, if you will, the SNMP or control system aspects. What you're talking about, again, SNMP, I think most people know, and what I'm gonna say is probably old, uh, versions one and two have minimal security. They require workarounds. Version three has much better security, but two things. Number one, there are a lot of devices that simply can't implement version three. Number two, Georgia Tech did a study several years ago and was able to comp uh, compromise version three. It's better, but like I say, it may not be implementable and it isn't your be all end all yet either. I think most people realize BACnet, the BACnet standards only offer 56 bit encryption. No, it's not missing a two in front. Um, <clears throat> there are very few BACnet systems that implement a viable security option. Uh, one of the things I just saw in preparation for the presentations I have to give to the Federal Facilities Council is there was a presentation about why um, BACnet secure may, you know, should not be implemented. This was by uh, on the BACnet uh, site. Um, Modbus serial, you know, unencrypted. Uh, Bluetooth, generally no security. And even the latest versions are generally insecure. All of these are things that are implemented in building control devices. And one of the places that I see almost no discussion about when you talk about building controls are control rooms and control centers. You know, what does that mean to the people and the equipment in control rooms and control centers? This isn't just your, if you will, in, you know, office building. Um, there have been issues, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> alerts on SNMP. They've been out there for years. Um, this has basically been the uh, recommendations. They're old, and I've seen nothing with this as it would apply to solar winds, even though this is something that needs to be done. Um, <clears throat> these are the impacts. You know, what you're looking at HVAC, I think most people know what that is, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, when you compromise them, um, you know, you can conceal errors, you can adjust temperature, humidity, power, you can power cycle systems, you could damage, you know, this has already happened, not for solar winds, but there's been at least uh, one data center where there was a cyber attack and they were able to fry every single server in the data center. Um, manage switches. You know, once you get into the manage switches, and what does um, SNMP allow? It monitors all managed switches. Your power distribution units. This is basically what is providing power if you will, to all of your building control systems. Um, <clears throat> like, I mean, you know, this, this can cause not only denial of service, my real focus is the physical damage that can occur. You know, perimeter sensors, obviously, but process sensors where you're measuring pressure, level, flow, temperature, voltage, current, motor speed, position. Um, there's no security there. There's no cyber logging there. And yet there is access to that via SNMP. And finally, I mentioned before the UPS, the uninterruptible power supply. Um, just as an aside, 
the San Bruno natural gas pipeline rupture, the genesis, the origin of that rupture was the replacement of an uninterruptible power supply at a local SCADA center. That's what actually started the San Bruno natural gas pipeline event. The summary of the vulnerabilities, you know, building management systems can connect to the internet. Um, in most cases, there is no device authentication with any of the building management system uh, you know, control systems. To this day, even the newer devices, they're configurable. You know, they're moving more and more to quote unquote IoT, which it, uh, gives you the ability to change device software and configurations. Encryption is either trivial or non-existent. Anyone can send read and write commands to the device. Um, because this is so extensive, you're talking about you know, hundreds and hundreds of devices on a network. Um, just as an aside, um, when people talk, I'm going just to show you how big, well, I'll leave that for another time, uh, but device vulnerabilities. There's almost no forensic trails when you get down to the devices. Uh, what you see there, what got me on this was the week before Solar Winds was announced. This was one of the major con uh, building control system suppliers was offering an integral flow meter, basically a uh, uh, flow, uh, flow sensor valve and actuator in one that they were connecting to the internet. And they said, hey, we've got um, a password uh, for the operator, but they never even considered any uh, security at the actual device level, which meant once you were in, you could do anything. What do we do? So the issue is, you know, the first parts I think is what you normally think about. You got to secure the outer perimeter. Remote access is, you know, a very, very big deal. Um, we need to be able to authenticate SNMP traffic. There is technology that can be used for that. One of the things that's missing is the ability to validate sensor traffic from the sensors to the controllers. This is at the discrete, or if you will, serial or analog layer. From the PLC out to the HMI, there's plenty of security uh, technology out there. The concern is what happens as you're going from the sensor to the controller. And there's work going on <clears throat> to look all the way down at the atomic level of the sensor to really provide authentication and verification and sensor accuracy. None of that exists today, to this day. People in process, again, I'm repeating much of what I heard because what I heard was really good. It requires a community of effort. The supply chains, both people and equipment need to be validated. One of the problems we have is there is almost no cybersecurity training for the engineers, the equipment suppliers and the system integrators. Certainly none based on actual control system cyber incidents. Um, there's almost no control system cybersecurity policies based on actual incidents. These are different. These are things we never considered. Um, <clears throat> and the need to implement the CISA recommended SNMP workarounds. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is what has been missing all along, you know, when you start talking about procurement language. There is no procurement language to this day for control system devices. There wasn't in 2010 when Idaho put together the uh, procurement documents, um, <clears throat> we were trying to do that for, uh, like I say, 62443-4-2. And it turns out that the best we could do was say, use compensating controls. I am on a 
ISA 84, which is process safety, ISA 99, cybersecurity working group, where we're looking at for the first time, what should be done for security all the way down at the safety level. This is what is missing because it turns out these devices, you know, particularly all of our process sensors, especially all digital sensors, have built-in back doors that must function. That's the only way to maintain them. What do we do about hardware back doors that are required to be there? And with that, again, thank you very much, Sands, for allowing me to, uh, to participate. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, that was awesome, Joe. Thank you so much for, for coming and taking part of this. Uh, you know, I, as you well know, I met you at the very beginning of my, my public career, sort of leaving the government, and I've always been a, a, a fan and I've always appreciated your insights. And uh, um, it's just been a thrill to get you at the SANS conference finally. So thanks for uh, taking time out to do it uh, and sharing this. I think we do have a, a couple minutes for questions. I mean, I know uh, there's been some active folks um, jumping in and around and like and asking a variety of things. So let's, let's start with the, the first one here. Um, so in terms of authentication for sensors, um, and you may have addressed this a little bit, but are there any examples and things like 61850 or security standards for how IEDs can authenticate themselves, or is it just generally not being addressed? It's not being addressed at the sensor or the lower device level, because what's happened is, and this is part of what we've been dealing with, with this joint 8499 working group, at the sensor layer itself, <clears throat> whether it's analog or digital. For example, there's no token, there's no anything else in there. And part of what we're having to live with is it's not even capable of being backfitted. So what we've been trying to do is figure out, okay, how best do we work around that? And that's also why I'm looking at this newer technology that in a funny sense, how can we use physics to backfit what isn't there. Mm -hmm. Does that help? A absolutely, and I and I agree violently with you that just we don't have good root cause analysis and cyber forensics, and there's a lot of cases we'll respond to as an example when it's, well, I got nothing, so I guess we'll rule this as a misoperation. You know, I guess this is an issue, and uh, that, that's, that's um, we gotta do better. Um, and so the, the last one's really just for, for references. And, and I mean, there's a bunch of comments in the Slack in terms of um, cheering you on and, and appreciation, but um, there's a number asking for like the Harvard study and the BACnet um, study and some of that you're referring to. I, am, I imagine pointing them to your blog is probably the best way to address that. Or do you have uh, links or, or other things that you want to share? Uh, if they can point me to the blog, I've been working with others who are directly involved and I can if people are interested, send me an email and I can try and get you the links. Perfect. You know, right. yeah, so, for, oh, sorry, I was going to say, for what it's worth, when I do all of this, I try and reach out to people that are most intimately involved. And so I can go to the, in a funny sense, the source. Yeah, absolutely. No, and there's just a bunch of praise over here for um, always nice to see, you know, from an engineering perspective, uh, talking about these issues and making sure that you're educating other engineers and similar. Um, I, I think it's spot on that there's got to be things done from a tech side, but there's also just got to be a lot of education done on the engineering that they just never have prepared for this before. And I, I remember sitting down talking to you over the years and you're talking about, I, I believe it was like your father-in-law you know, working with like Oppenheimer yeah. and like all these amazing yeah. stories. And it's just such a beautiful and amazing engineering community. And, and we've got to do more to help them be successful. So um, we're, we're at time, but, but Joe, I just want to say again, thank you so much for the folks that want to reach out to Joe. He's got his email there over in the Slack channel. I just reposted his blog. Um, and uh, Joe, if you have time to jump in there, you've got, you've got a lot of fans and, and folks I'm sure would love to talk to you. So okay. thank you again, Joe. Rob, thank you again for the invite. Absolutely.